Uh, I want to offer you two takeaways from that talk. Uh, years ago, uh, Willie Soon calculated that using the, uh, the, the largest supercomputer in, in America, the, the Cray computer, uh, it would take something like 40 years to run a single iteration of a climate model that actually used all of the variables. Uh, but of course, they don't use only the variables they think they know. Well, you just saw that while the climate models uh, claim they can predict the Earth's temperature uh, down to a very small amount decades, if not a century ago, we are still incapable of accurately measuring rainfall. That's something to remember. Uh, our third and last speaker before the Q&A is Pat Michaels. Pat is the director of the Center for Study of Science at the Cato Institute and a former president of the American Association of State Climatologists. Pat? Good morning. It's, it's good to be with you. Uh, and uh, I have to say, with regard to the last, last presentation, that was a great presentation because I have had trouble with that increase in extreme uh, rainfall in the northeastern United States. We found a similar result, I think, what, about 2004. And when we moved our data further and further west, we saw what you saw. Well, thank you for explaining that. That's the way science should work. Uh, and and uh, same to Willie, very good presentation. Uh, some people get the opportunity sometimes not to show you something new, but to show you how bad the present is. And that's what I'm going to talk about, a little bit of history. Uh, in 2007, the Supreme Court ruled in Mass v. EPA that the EPA was required to regulate carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, under the Clean Air Act if it found that carbon dioxide endangered human health and welfare. That was in the Bush administration. They decided that they were not going to think about it. Um, when Obama came to town, the second substantive item in his 2009 inaugural speech was on climate change. And 90 days after he came to town, the EPA issued a preliminary finding of endangerment from carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, by December 7, 2009, in time for the Copenhagen Climate Conference, the last climate conference that was supposed to produce a major international agreement, the EPA formally announced endangerment from carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Uh, it's a little bit different this year in the run-up for Paris. Uh, we, have, we have moved from the presidential administration to the ecclesiastical administration, and the Pope is going to announce hell and brimstone uh, for all of those who don't believe. Anyway, so I'd like to talk to you about the EPA's uh, science, such as it is, uh, and uh, here we are. State of Michigan versus Environmental Protection Agency, recently decided by the Supreme Court. This was uh, the, the case which said that, uh, the, that mercury regulations uh, were inappropriate because they did not uh, properly uh, they did not properly define a problem, uh, and m many of the internal analyses were wrong. Uh, and we filed a brief on that uh, from the Cato Institute. Uh, EPA contended that mercury emissions from the U.S. Uh, power plants reduces the IQ of susceptible children. Well, that's bad, because one of the ways to sell climate change is always to talk about the children. Uh, and EPA then contended that this imposed a net economic burden across the nation. In other words, if your IQ is lower, you don't earn as much in your life. Now, I know an awful lot of smart, unemployed people, but what do I know? <laughs> or they work for think tanks. Uh, anyway, so let's talk about the children and let's talk about mercury. So I decided uh, to produce a motif that would be... Um, <clears throat> rather intriguing for all. This is the relative amount of mercury uh, the, in, in, that goes into our atmosphere. 7,500 metric tons is the total annual load of mercury into the atmosphere. Of that, almost half of it is natural, coming from volcanoes. Uh, and the human component uh, is about 2,000. But the U.S. is 121, and U.S. power plants 
uh, are 12. So the relative size of the babies shows the relative contribution of mercury. And you can see the amount from US power plants is completely nugatory. Now, how did the EPA decide to, to generate this figure of IQ loss? Well, they had this idea that if people consumed a lot of freshwater fish, that they would concentrate mercury uh, in their blood. And if a woman who consumed a lot of freshwater fish did this, the child's IQ would be impaired. So the EPA invented a population of 240,000 hypothetical women. They don't exist. And these hypothetical women consumed, on the average, up to 100, uh, 300 pounds of fish per year, or one pound per day. And uh, I am not making this up. And as a result, uh, when they had their children, there was an effect. So here they eat 300 pounds of fish per year. This is a lot of fish, mainly walleye, et cetera. Uh, and the average IQ loss, according to the EPA, I do not make this up. I know. Okay. Many of my talks, people are laughing. You should be crying. All this is true. The EPA calculated that the average IQ loss to a in a child who is born by a woman who consumes 300 pounds of hand-caught fish per year is 0 .0, you can't measure it, OK? 0 .00209 IQ points for, for child. Uh, and uh, the, night, the only problem is, you see, the IQ uh, test was actually designed with very, very good statistics. I know Briggs is going to disagree with me. But if your IQ is 100, or the average for the total population, it's actually somewhere between 95 and 105. One standard deviation is, uh, uh, or 95 percent confidence limit, I'm sorry, two standard deviations is 10 points in IQ. So we're saying somehow that we're going to be able to detect 0 .00209 IQ points when the measurement error is plus or minus 5. Not, not plus or minus 10, sorry about that. OK. Uh, and so I just thought, again, I'd use my baby motif to show this in, in graphical form. The average baby has an IQ of 100. And the baby harmed by mercury has an average IQ of 99.99791, according to our Environmental Protection Agency. When we wrote this as an amicus brief in the case, the Michigan, Michigan versus EPA, we thought this might you know, get the attention of a couple of the more quantitatively oriented justices on the Supreme Court. Uh, and uh, indeed, it did get their attention. There was some comment on it. So uh, here we go. Oh, and by the way, I keep my, my other repeating motif here is the US, the, the mini, mini baby down there. That's the US power plant contribution of mercury compared to the global load of mercury. And that, that little baby is, uh, I think, uh, one or, or 12 seven thousandths the size of the big baby in the first illustration. So the EPA then has math. It turns IQ points into money. I'm not making this up. 0 .00209 IQ points, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, results in an average loss in annual income of $1,425. Now, the amazing thing about EPA is the precision of their science. They can measure IQ to thousandths of a point and convert that into dollars uh, in four significant digits. It's really quite remarkable, and it costs $3,350,000 a year. According to the EPA, you multiply that. That's, that's the point zero zero two zero nine multiplied by 240,000 hypothetical women, and you get the idea. So you're supposed to go forward here. So that's it for their mercury. Now we have other things that are happening in Washington, D.C., which is uh, when the EPA did its mercury case, it was had to, to come up with a harm averted by their policy. And that harm averted was the IQ argument. Yes, that was their science. Now they have something called the social cost of carbon, which is entering into all kinds of administration calculations on 
uh, uh, <clears throat> related to climate change regulations. And, um, you know, Mr. Gorbachev, I was not a fan, am not a fan, but he did ensconce some kind of uh, aphorisms in, in world dialogue, and one of them was, that's old thinking. Well, this is old science, and it's what the EPA and others use to determine the social cost of carbon. These are probability distributions for uh, equilibrium climate sensitivity. That's the amount of warming you ultimately get for doubling carbon dioxide that have been used, uh, uh, that are used in the, in the government's calculation of the social cost of carbon. Uh, these are the 90% confidence limits. The, this has, these all have something called fat tails. Uh, um, <clears throat> people fear fat tails, both in their personal and, and environmental lives. <laughs> and what you see here on the black line is the distribution used by the government to calculate the social cost of carbon. So yes, it's based upon old science with fat tails. Uh, where did the oh, clicker, it's right there. Uh, now let's take a look at what has happened since the beginning of 2011. All these papers now, about 60 separate experiments in the refereed scientific literature, are now showing dramatically reduced sensitivity to carbon dioxide. Here is what the government used to calculate the social cost of carbon. And here are all these papers, most recently the very good one by Nick Lewis and Judy Curry, which clearly shows the sensitivity of carbon temp temperature to carbon dioxide is probably around 1.25 to 1.6 degrees Celsius, which is very consistent with what's being observed. Anyway, uh, there's, a, there's a paper here that I did not put up because it's not in this time frame. Uh, it was by Michaels et al. in 2002. And it did enter into this debate, uh, into this discussion. About a year ago, Andy Revkin from the New York Times wrote that he, he was touching the, the subject of decreased sensitivity and said, scientists are, I'm quoting as best I can, scientists are reluctant to acknowledge this because it appears to be consistent with a paper published more than 10 years ago by a scientist normally associated with libertarian think tanks. So <laughs> I have acquired no name. Now, <clears throat> in certain religious circles, that's quite a compliment. But uh, yes, uh, it was admitted that that was done. Now, <clears throat> fact of the matter is, it's not the heat, it's the sensitivity. This curve shows you uh, observed and modeled global temperature evolution, and you can see the, uh, it, the, with a sensitivity of 3 degrees C, uh, it's off by uh, uh, more than it is with a sensitivity of 2 degrees C, and it's obviously less than that. And by the way, just in case you're wondering, here is the actual temperature, the bulk temperature of the lower troposphere. This is the, now the new record from uh, University of Alabama, Huntsville. It goes back to 1994. We are in our 21st year without a significant warming trend. And by the way, this is a direct reproduction now of, uh, oh, I duplicated a slide. Sorry, no wonder it looks the same. The, 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 uh, the Wentz uh, remote, system, remote sensing systems curve looks exactly the same now. And then there's, of course, the problem with the northern hemisphere. Sea ice, that is declining. Well, no, it's not. People don't know that about 2006 or so, the decline in northern hemisphere sea ice stopped. Now, that's, that's, we're going to be about 10 years into that very, very soon. And what's going on in the southern hemisphere is an equal and opposite increase in sea level or in, in ice. So what you have are not much warming, a low sensitivity, and uh, uh, agencies that are simply disregarding both of those. There's the global sea ice. You can see here at the end, we are about to have the longest period of above the long-term average sea ice that we've ever experienced. Uh, I will close with this. Uh, just to remind you that the, on June 23rd, 1988, James Hansen lit the bonfire of the greenhouse vanities by saying there was a strong cause and effect relationship between the current climate and human alteration of the atmosphere. The day before, the high in Washington, D.C. at DCA Airport was 101 degrees. That's a rare event here. The low was in the mid-70s. Uh, Tim Worth and this guy colluded the night before the hearing to open up the windows in the hearing room, which disables the air conditioning, and so it was hotter than hell, and that's why he was sweating when he gave this testimony. Science had already become theater 
in 1988 with regard to global warming. Uh, now let's see how, how Hansen's models and the other models are doing. This is my last image. This graphic is complicated, but you really need to look at it. Uh, the uh, solid line is the, uh, the observed change in temperature for periods of different length ending in 2014. This is 10 years in length, nine, uh, 11 years, 12 years, on to 61 years. So this is 2005 through 2014. This is 2004 through 2014, all the way to 1951 to 2014. This, these, uh, this distribution is the, the output of all 107 models used by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its most recent uh, compilation. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> this is the 95 percent confidence limits for the output of those models, which is pretty normally distributed, by the way and this is the 97.5% confidence limit. And the colored dots are the observed temperature trends that around the world from the, from the Hadley temperature record. Uh, you can see, for one thing, all the observed trends are below. Every last one of them, from 10 years back to 62 years in length, is below what, was, uh, uh, what uh, the model value is. And, uh, the colored dots, when it gets to yellow, the modeled values are uh, on, at below the 95% confidence limits, and by the time we get to red, they're below the 97.5% confidence limits. This is a failure. So they got the sensitivity wrong, the climate models are wrong, you haven't warmed up for over two decades, and ice around the globe is neutral. And yet we continue to regulate, you know why? because of the children. Thank you very much.